السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين والصلاة والسلام على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا محمد وعلى آله وأصحابه أجمعين وبعد All praise is due to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala Blessings and salutations upon Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam We ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to bless him and all his companions And we ask Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala to grant us all goodness to accept us in this month of Ramadan. As we say, it is a sacrifice. And we keep repeating that it is a sacrifice, but we are prepared to sacrifice for the pleasure of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. For indeed, He is our creator, our maker, the one who created us, the one who made us. For Him, we dedicate our entire lives. For Him, we are ready to put our heads on the ground and we do so so many times a day solely for the one who made us, the one whom we are going to return to. We would never put our heads on the ground for any being besides Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Yesterday we heard the story of Sheath alayhi salatu wasalam. This evening I'd like to move to the story of Idris alayhi salatu wasalam, known as Enoch. May peace be upon him in the English language. Where exactly does he fit in? The majority of the historians say that he was one of the great grandchildren of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam, meaning from the progeny, the seventh generation of Adam alayhi salatu wasalam. However, there are some historians who make mention of the fact that he may be from amongst the children of Jacob and from amongst Banu Israel, meaning the grandchildren, the progeny of Jacob and the people of Musa alayhi salatu wasalam. However, we will stick to this opinion as the majority of the scholars have made mention of it. So when Adam alayhi salatu was 840 years old, this is when he was born. One might ask, where do we get all these details from? It's very interesting. We need to know it. We should know that Islamic history is divided into two categories. That which is from the time of the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wasallam to now, and what happened after the Prophet ﷺ and at his time and all the way to now, that we are not allowed to take from Ahlul Kitab or the people of the book. We're not allowed to take it at all. In fact, we have to take it bil isnad, which means every story that is narrated to us, we need to know who brought the story, where it came from, what is the chain of narrators, from the person speaking right to the source of the story. If there is a single individual in that chain that is shady, that is dodgy to use that word, that is known as a liar, that is lying because he says I've heard from someone and that person passed away before this one was even born. Then we know that they are lying. If that is the case, we reject that. Even if it is Islamic history, we don't want that story. But when it comes to the history before Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, I have explained in the first session here, that there is something known as Israeliyat. Israeliyat are the narrations of the people of the book. What the Torah holds, what the Bible, the Old Testament holds, and the stories that have been brought from those people. And they, these are divided into three categories. It's important that we repeat these three categories. Those that Islam or the Sharia came and rejected them. Those narrations, we reject them. For example, some came with the story of the Prophet Lot and Lut alayhi salatu wasalam, and they mentioned that he was a sinful man. We reject it because in Islam we believe that is not true. He was a pure individual, the best of his time. So we reject that. And we reject anything that Islam has rejected, even though it may, we may have heard it from others. Then we have those narrations that have come that Islam has confirmed. We find them within the Quran. I give you an example. The fact that Eve, may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's peace be upon her, Hawa alayha salatu wasalam, was created from Adam. We hear that in the Quran, in two places in the Quran. Allah makes mention of it in Surah Al-A'raf as well as in Surah Al-Nisa. So what the Sharia has confirmed, we take it through because Islam has confirmed it. And there is the third category, which is the bulk of it. Islam has not spoken about it, neither confirming nor rejecting. With that, we do exactly the same. We will hear it, we will understand it, we will draw a lesson from it, but we neither, we do not need it to be Muslims. But if we can use that in order to understand, then be it. 
At the same time, we neither accept nor reject. So we do not reject it. But we say, after we mention the story, we say, Wallahu a'lam, Allah knows best. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. So, Sheith alayhi salatu was salam is not mentioned in the Quran. We spoke about Israeli riwayat that Islam has neither rejected nor confirmed. The same applies Idris alayhi salatu was salam. They say he was born when Adam alayhi salam was 840 years old. That we got from the Israeli riwayat. And then they say that he was a man who was tall, he was very good looking, he was very calm, he had a full grown beard. Subhanallah. And he spoke very, very clearly. When he spoke, he was calm. When he walked, he lowered his gaze and looked on the ground. And he was a very collected individual, calm and collected. And he used to ponder and reflect. And he used to advise with so much goodness. That was Idris alayhi salatu was salam. So what does the Quran make mention of this Prophet? There are only two verses that we find in the Quran regarding the Prophet Idris alayhi salatu was salam. Firstly, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about him in Surah Maryam. وَذْكُرْ فِي الْكِتَابِ Idris, And make mention in the book of the Prophet Idris. إِنَّهُ كَانَ صِدِّيقًا نَبِيًّا Indeed, he was very truthful and he was a prophet. So this now we know confirmed. He was truthful and he was a prophet. The quality of truthfulness. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَرَفَعْنَاهُ مَكَانًا عَلِيًّا Indeed, we raised him a very, very high status. We raised him to a very high level. This is what the Quran says in Surah Maryam. So, if you look at the Mufassireen, they make mention of the meaning of a high level. If I were to ask you, someone is raised on a high level, what would you say? You would say that spiritually they are elevated. So the same with Idris alayhi salatu was salam. He was elevated to a very high level by Allah in that he was granted nubuwa and he was praised by Allah. And he is mentioned in the Quran that is a high level. In fact, in another place, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَإِسْمَاعِيلَ وَإِدْرِيسَ وَذَا الْكِفْلِ Three names together. Ismail, Idris, and Dhal Kifl. May Allah's peace be upon them. Kullum min as-sabirin wa adkhalnahum fi rahmatina innahum min as-salihin. All three of them were very patient. So this is another quality of Idris. He was very patient. And Allah says, and we have granted them from our mercy. We have made them enter into our mercy. We have, we have put them within our mercy. So that is another quality. Allah has had mercy on them. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Kullum min as salihin They were all pious people, good people. Salih means a pious person. So these are the qualities of Idris alayhi salatu was salam we know. And this is definitely a very high status. However, we have a very interesting Israeli riwayah. A narration of the people of the book, which we say, Wallahu a'lam, Allah knows best. But it's interesting to mention it because most books of tafsir have made mention of this beautiful incident. They say Idris alayhi salam, he was told by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala that, Oh Idris, from those who have followed you, anyone who does good deeds, at the end of the day, you will have all those good deeds doubled for yourself. That is something amazing. This is a status. Imagine others do good deeds and you getting the reward of it doubled. So he was very happy and he knew that his death was approaching. So he had a friend from the angels and he spoke to this friend. He says, you know, Allah has promised me this reward and I'd like to amass a lot of reward before I go. So why don't we speak to the angel of death? Let's see what he has to say. To say, look, just try and see if you can seek permission to prolong a little bit. So the angel says, look, that is a matter that is decreed by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. However, there's no harm in trying. Come, you ride on my wing and let's go. Subhanallah. So he rode on the wing and he was taken up to the heavens. He crossed the first heaven. He crossed the second heaven. He crossed the third heaven. When he got to the fourth heaven, Allah had instructed the angel of death to take the soul of Idris alayhi salam on the fourth heaven. And the angel of death was 
following the instruction of Allah, but obviously did not know what was about to happen. When he got to the fourth heaven, he seen Idris there. Amazing. When he seen Idris there, the question was posed that look, I would like to extend and so on. He says, look, Allah has already instructed me to take your ruh away. Is it okay? He says, well, if that's the case, it's fine. So it is narrated. Wallahu a'lam. Allah knows best that his ruh was taken away whilst he was still in the fourth heaven. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa confirms in Sahih al-Bukhari in an authentic narration that when he went up for Mi'raj, he met Idris alayhi salam in the fourth heaven. So that is a confirmed narration that we know. It's actually hair raising as we say it. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us understanding. That is as much as we know about the life of Idris alayhi salatu wasalam. And this is why some of the mufassirin say when Allah says he raised him to a high level, he is speaking of literally Allah took him up physically to the top and then his soul was taken there. Let's move on to the next prophet who is known as the first prophet sent to mankind at large. Sent to the globe at large. We all know that Adam alayhi salam was a messenger and his son Sheath and Idris and these people were part of the family of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. But they were sent to remind their own families. It was one family. Nuh alayhi salam, I remember telling you a few days ago that how was he a messenger? He began reminding his children after they were born and they grew up that look, this is what happened to me and this is what happened when... This is what happened when uh, shaitan refused to prostrate to me and so on. So be careful. So the hadith Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Kana bayna Adam wa Nuh asharatu qurun kulluha ala tawheed. Between Adam, may peace be upon him, and Nuh, Noah, may peace be upon him, there were 10 generations. Or a qarn can be translated as generation or it can be translated as a century. So there was a certain period of time, let's say if it was a century, there were 10 centuries, all the people were on Islam, they were on Tawheed, they did not associate partners with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What is the meaning of this narration? It's a correct narration. It means that for a thousand years, there was no shirk. Between Adam and Nuh, there was much more than a thousand years, but there were a thousand years in which there was no shirk. There was no association of partners with Allah. And after a thousand years, it crept in. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala sent Noah, may peace be upon him, as the first prophet to those who were engaged in shirk. To mankind at large, and shirk was in them. Now how did this association of partnership come about? We need to know what the Quran says. We need to know the authentic narrations from the Quran. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of it. Let us mention it in story form. Then we'll read the verse a little bit later on inshallah. Where shaitan came to the children later on. You see, they had transgressed as we heard the family of Qabil and those people Sheikh alayhi salam was sent to. And in fact, those people whom Idris was sent to, they had transgressed. They were committing lots and lots of sin, but they were not associating partners with Allah. Their acts of worship were solely for their maker. They knew that they had a maker and they only owed all their worship to that maker. However, they were sinning here, sinning there, adultery was being committed, so many other sins were being committed. And as time passed, shaitan came to them. They had certain pious people from amongst them. If you look at Surah Nuh, you will find the names of these pious people. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has named them. Waddan, Suwa'an, Yaghuth, Ya'uq, and Nasr. These are five names mentioned in the Quran. They were pious people. Shaitan came to the, the people of that time and said, Look, these are pious people who are reminding you to do good. They are very good people. They have reminded you to do good. Now that they've died, just make a small statue to remind you of their message. So every time you see the statue, you'll be able to remember that this person used to remind us of good and you will do the good. So it was beautified. They saw nothing wrong in that. They created statues and each one was named after one of these pious people. And every time they came and they saw these statues, they were very happy. It reminded them to do good and they began to do good. Now shaitan is very patient. He's got a plan. He sows the seed and he goes away. So he waited for that generation to pass. 
When that generation passed and people forgot why exactly they had made those statues, he went to the next generation and said, you know, your forefathers, you don't know what they used to do. They used to worship these idols. These are statues. This is what brought them goodness. And he conned them. How did he con them? Listen very carefully. He said, whenever they saw these idols, they worshiped the idols so they became good people and goodness came in their direction. Look at how he's twisting the words. Part is true, part is not true. When they saw these statues, they never used to worship them, but they were reminded they used to do good. So a person would go to the statue, come back and give a charity. Wow, that was good. A person would go to the statue, come back and be, be well behaved. That was good. So shaitan says, don't you see the statue used to help them to become good. So you need to prostrate to these statues in order to become even better. So this is when shirk started. This is the first association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. What we learn today, up to now, as sophisticated as man has become, we have technology, we have the Bluetooth, we have Wi-Fi. Very soon we'll be having yellow teeth and green teeth. Allahu Akbar. But we still have people who worship stones, who think that that brings them goodness, who worship trees, who worship various other objects, who worship creatures of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and think that these things are going to bring us goodness. There are people who worship animals thinking that these animals are going to bring us goodness. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, he becomes very, very angry with this association of partnership with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So it is very strange how man's brain has developed to the degree that he has technology of the highest, most baffling level, mind-boggling. But at the same time, he'll worship a stone, Allahu Akbar. And he'll go and bow down to a cow, Allahu Akbar. And he'll go and bow down to a tree. And he'll go and bow down to another human being who also needs the loo just like him, Allahu Akbar. It's a fact. And I've mentioned the worst thing because this needs to make us think. Allah's given us the brain. If you have a belly problem, they have it too. How do we worship human beings? In Allah abta'ata Muhammadan sallallahu alayhi wa sallama liyukhrija nas min ibadati al-ibad ila ibadati rabbi al-ibad. Allah has sent Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to remove people from worshipping other worshippers to worshipping the Lord of all the worshippers. Subhanallah. So we don't worship other worshippers. People began to worship Isa, they began to worship the others. At this particular stage, they were worshipping these five idols. So Nuh alayhi salatu was sent. When he was sent, very, very interestingly, Allah makes mention of it. In fact, his name, or should I say not the name, but mention of Nuh alayhi salatu was is in 20 different surahs of the Quran. 20 different surahs of the Quran. He has a very lofty level. You see, all the messengers are not of the same level. Allah says in the Quran, Those messengers, we have raised some above the others. Some of them we have spoken to. Allahu Akbar. And Allah has raised the levels. So there were five who were the highest. They were the most resolute and they endured the most for the sake of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Who were these five? Right at the top, Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, subhan al Allah has granted him that status, highest of all messengers and of all creatures. Afdalu al-khalqi wa akramu rusuli The highest of creation and the most honored of all the messengers is Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allahu Akbar. To read through his biography, not only will it bring tears to the eyes, but if we are not shaken, how can we claim to be believers? May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us that opportunity and that acceptance to feel in our hearts the urge and the need to go through the biography of the most beloved creature that existed. Sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So he was at the top. Then we had Ibrahim alayhi salatu wa salam, Nuh alayhi salam, Musa alayhi salam, and Isa alayhi salam. These five names are found in the Quran. Allah calls them 
ulul azmi min al rusuli. These were the resolute from amongst the messengers of a different level. Wa id akhadna min al nabiyin min thaqahum wa minka wa min nuh wa ibrahim wa musa wa isa ibn maryam. Allah subhanahu wa taala makes mention of the five there. That we have taken the strong covenant from you, O Muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam, wa min Nuhin, wa Ibrahim, wa Musa, wa Isa ibn Maryam. Allahu Akbar. So those are the five that were the highest. So Allah subhanahu wa taala makes mention of him very beautifully in Surah Al-A'raf. Allah says, and it's always very direct. Allah says, "لَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إلَى قَوْمِهِ." فقال يا قوم اعبدوا الله ما لكم من إله غيره. And remember, we sent Nuh to his people. So he said to them directly, "O my people, worship Allah alone. You have no deity besides Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. Nobody worthy of worship besides Allah Subhanahu wa Taala." So the first message of all the messengers was calling towards Tawheed. Calling towards the oneness of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, calling towards leaving the association of partnership with that Maker and that Creator. So Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says, He told His people, "Inni akhafu alaykum adab yawm alim." I fear over you the punishment of that day the great day i fear that a punishment will overtake you in another place he says i fear that a very painful torment will overtake you so they are listening to this man he's saying worship one allah and i fear that punishment is overtaking you they did not want to listen they wanted to carry on in their ways so look what they says قال الملا من قومه انا لنراك في ضلال مبين the chiefs from amongst the people who was who was talking allah says al mala al mala meaning the chiefs those who had authority those who had power those who had wealth those who had respect in society they spoke they said you are astray dalal one word this man is astray don't listen to him he answered قال يا قوم ليس بي ضلاله ولكني رسول من رب العالمين. He said, "Oh my people, I am not astray. I am a messenger from the Lord of the worlds. أبلغكم رسالة ربي. I am only conveying to you the messages of my own Rabb. وأنصح لكم. And I am giving you advice, نصيحة." Sound advice I am delivering to you. So don't hold it against me. Don't call me a madman. Weigh what I am saying, and if it makes sense, and it will definitely make sense if you are ready to ponder over it, then follow it. So a few people started following him. Who? Very few. After so many years, one person. After so many years, another person. Subhanallah. And yet he was a nabi of Allah Subhanahu wa Taala, and the rest of them. They followed the haughty. They followed those who had money. They followed those who had authority. They followed those who had dignity in society, and they had given dignity to those who had material wealth. Why do we say this? Because Allah speaks about it in the Quran, and Allah Subhanahu wa Taala says this. Allah says in Surah Hud. Allah says. فقال الملأ الذين كفروا من قومه ما نراك إلا بشرا مثلنا. Those haughty, those who were high, those who were in control, they had controlled all the people, and they told Nuh عليه الصلاة والسلام, "We see you as a human being just like us. We see you as a human being just like us." What happens in our lives? A lesson we draw from it. When someone reminds us to say, "Brother, this is wrong," say, "Hey, look at yourself. Who are you? Who do you think you are?" Allahu Akbar. I had one youngster tell me, even my father doesn't tell me that. Allahu Akbar. Well, bring him, we'll tell him as well. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open, us, open our doors. Just as well you told me he doesn't say it, now we know that he also needs a bit of advice. May Allah make us parents who are role models for our own children. Amen. Wallahi, that's a powerful dua. May Allah make us parents who are the role models of our own children. Amen. Allahu Akbar. So, they told him, you are just a human being like us. وَمَا نَرَاكَ تَبَعَكَ and, and look at those who are following you. Look at them. 
They are the worst from amongst us. They've got no material standing at all. Nobody respects them in society. They are foolish. They haven't even thought before they followed you. They don't even know what's about to come in their direction. As though they are threatening to boycott these people. Imagine. So who followed? Those who were downtrodden. And this is why when Abu Sufyan, radiallahu anhu, before he was a Muslim, he had gone to Hercules, the Roman. And Hercules asked him a question, he raql, about Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He says, what type of people are following him? The rich or the poor? He said, well, most of his followers are the poor. He says, well, that is all the messengers. It has happened to them, quite similar. Look, Hercules is confirming that those who are downtrodden and not so wealthy, they are quicker to accept the truth than those who are high and those who are wealthy. Allahu Akbar. We are fortunate, we are Muslimin. We hope and pray that the more we get in terms of wealth, the more down to earth we are. The quicker we surrender to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala's command. May Allah open our doors of goodness. May He grant us pure sustenance that, bring us, that brings us closer to Him and not sustenance that will drive us further away. People normally say that this man was a good man. Now that he's seen money, he's changed. I usually say no. Money doesn't change you. All it does, it gives you now the opportunity to show the true colors of who you always were. Because if you had bad qualities, they were hidden. When you have a boss, you need to say, yes, okay. He says, be here at eight. No, five to eight. He says, okay. But the day you got more money than him, you say, what? Five to eight, you're mad. I'm going to come at 11. Allahu Akbar. May Allah open our doors. Because now you know you have a standing. So it only gave you the opportunity to show your true colors. Those who were good prior to wealth, they are still good even after the, they've got that wealth. May Allah keep us in that way. So this was the excuse. They said, we see these people are all weak. We don't see any virtue for you over us. In fact, we consider you liars. You are a liar. What virtue do you have over us? You're just like us. You've got eyes and ears and hands and everything just like us. You are a human being. There's no virtue. This was the excuse of the people of Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of that in Surah Hud. And this is why he told his people, Ya qawmi ara'aytum in kuntu ala bayinatim min rabbi. Oh my people, listen, listen very carefully. What if Allah has granted me signs, clear proof, clear evidence? Are you going to consider it? And what if Allah has given me mercy and has had mercy upon me, which you are blinded from? You cannot see. What do we learn from this? Allahu Akbar. Sometimes because of our evil deeds, we become blinded to the right, straight path. This is why I mentioned the other day that one of the greatest acts of worship is tawbah. To ask Allah's forgiveness, to search in your life where you are going astray and wrong and to constantly ask Allah's forgiveness. Because when you ask Allah's forgiveness, there is now hope that you will see the light. You know, one day there was a brother who told me regarding a certain problem. He says, at least now there's light at the end of the tunnel. I said, brother, they haven't yet seen the tunnel. Forget about the light. Allahu Akbar. May Allah open our doors. Really, sometimes people haven't even seen the tunnel. Once we get to the tunnel, then there'll be light at the end, inshallah. But if you haven't seen the tunnel, where? We'll probably head to the oceans. Allahu Akbar. May Allah open our doors. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says about Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam, that he says, what if Allah's mercy is blocked from you. What if Allah's mercy is blocked from you? You need to open your eyes and see what I'm saying. Turn to Allah. So his people continued to argue. They argued again with him. What did they say? In fact, he said again to his people, one more point. In ajriya illa ala Allahi. Oh my people, 
I am not going to ask any recompense from you. I don't want money for what I am teaching you. I don't want any wealth for what I am teaching you. And from this we learn straight point. Whenever there are those calling us towards goodness, the spiritual leaders, if they fall under the employ of someone, they are less effective than those who do not fall under the employ of someone. That is a general rule. Unless they've been given authority, which is very rare, you find that they are always tapered down by those who pay them. And this is why Nuh alayhi salam made it very clear. I not only don't get a salary from you, but I don't want it. I'm not asking you for a penny or a cent. My reward is with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why he could say whatever he wanted to. He uttered it, the truth. He didn't mind and he knew he had the assistance of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So they told him, okay, we're ready to accept. They had a private meeting. They said, we're ready to accept on condition that you see those who have followed you, they're all paupers. We're going to come and sit with those paupers and everybody's going to look at us and say, look, the top and the bottom. They are now mixing. That's not going to happen. So get rid of them. Tell them that, that you guys, you move out. We got some more important people who are coming to accept the guidance. Now the same was uttered by the kuffar of Quraysh to Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And here he is being told that that happened from the time of Nuh. So what did Nuh alayhi salatu wa salam say? وَمَا أَنَا بِطَارِدِ الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا I am never going to chase those who have believed. I can't chase them. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their level. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their condition. I am not going to chase them at all. He says, وَيَا قَوْمِ مَنْ يَنْصُرُنِي مِنَ اللَّهِ إِنْ طَرَدْتُهُمْ أَفَلَا تَذَنْكَرُونَ Oh my people, if I chase them away, who is going to help me when Allah's wrath and anger descends on me? Who is going to assist me against Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala if I chase away the believers? Allahu Akbar. And there are other beautiful verses in the Quran where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala makes mention of what Nuh alayhi salam said. He said, these people appear to be low in terms of worldly standings, but you don't know their hearts. You don't know their hearts. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. This is why sometimes we feel the piety in those who are poor, very, very poor. Sometimes we see people and I have witnessed people in some of the most remote areas of Africa. We entered one area. Very, very remote area at the time of Asr. And we were looking for Muslims. And we were going through, literally having parked the motor vehicle in one corner, one side, and we were walking through the bush. And we noticed a, we noticed these, uh, there was a field with a lot of plantation on it. Maize was planted and it was quite high, the height of a man. And as we walked through it, thinking that now there's no one, it was the time of Asr. We heard, and there were at least two, three hundred people reading salah and they had all come up. And where were they? Where were we? Wallahi, I had to weep when I'd seen that. And I told myself, these are the awliyaullah. These are the friends of Allah. They, for water, they go to the river, which is five kilometers away with buckets, but they're happy. Come time for asr. Nobody is there to tell them, hey, salah. And you find all of them quietly on the ground. No musallah, no nothing. On the ground, you know the sight. <laughs> I felt like I was such a weak Muslim looking at these people whom, who have endured so much and they are happily worshipping Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Where are we? It reminded me immediately of a verse that I need to share with you. Allah says, subhanahu wa ta'ala, يَا أَيُّهَا الَّذِينَ آمَنُوا مَنْ يَرْتَدَّ مِنْكُمْ عَنْ دِينِهِ فَسَوْفَ يَأْتِ اللَّهُ بِقَوْمْ يُحِبُّهُمْ وَيُحِبُّونَهُ Allah Akbar, O oh, you who believe. If whosoever is going to turn away from this deen, then remember Allah will bring other people whom He will love and they will love Him even more. Allah Akbar. So let's not turn away. When we don't read Salah, there are 10 other people who are reading Salah. Recently, in many countries, there are women who have removed their hijab because of the pressure of the globe. So by removing the hijab, I normally say, my dear sister, if you have removed it, there are 10 others somewhere else who have donned it. So it's not Allah's loss, it's your loss. For every person who thinks they have now removed the cover 
or remove the dress code that Allah has ordained. Allah says, don't worry, we flick you off. Do you know what? We'll show you on the day of judgment. As a result, there were 10 others who donned it. Allahu Akbar. You want to miss your salah. There are 10 other people in the remote regions of Vietnam who will start their salah. But we don't know. We are, our minds are too small. We don't understand and realize. So Nuh alayhi salam said, these people, they are pious. Allah knows their heart. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows the condition of their hearts. I'm not going to chase them away in order to facilitate for you and for you to come. Another thing, if he had chased them away and these people did come, that was one condition. Sometime later, they would have made another condition and a third condition. So a person who wants to attack you on one front, don't think that he's not going to attack you from all the other fronts. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant us a deep understanding. Remember these stories are mentioned in the Quran for us to derive lesson from. It was not needed to make mention of the previous stories. So much so that in this story of Nuh, when Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was mentioning this story to the kuffar of Quraysh and to the Muslimin, do you know what? They doubted. They said, no, this man is speaking things which are fabricated. So Allah says in the Quran, whilst in the midst of the story of Nuh alayhi salam, Am aftara? Are they saying that Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam has fabricated this? They don't know. قُلْ إِنْ افْتَرَيْتُ فَعَلَيَّ إِجْرَامِي وَأَنَا بَرِيءٌ مِّمَّا تُجْرِمُونَ O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, tell them, if I have fabricated this, I'm going to get the sin of it. And I'm not going to hold the sin of what you people are doing. So weigh what I'm saying. This is an example. It is a story of a previous nation confirmed by revelation without a speck of doubt. So Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about Nuh alayhi salatu was salam in Surah Al-Shu'ara as well. قَالَ وَمَا عِلْمِي بِمَا كَانُوا يَعْمَلُونَ إِنْ حِسَابُهُمْ إِلَّا عَلَى رَبِّي لَوْ تَشْعُرُونَ وَمَا أَنَا بِطَارِدِ الْمُؤْمِنِينَ إِنْ أَنَا إِلَّا نَذِيرٌ مُبِينٌ He had a response for everything they said. He had a response for everything they said. Allah makes mention of it here. They say, should we believe in you when all these useless people have accepted your message? There is a difference between us and them. Kick them out. He says, oh my people, I don't know their hearts. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala knows their deeds and their hearts. How can I block goodness from them solely because they, they don't have much materially? Allahu Akbar. I am a warner. I will warn clearly. And this warning will come. Now they got upset. They were upset. They started... For how many years did this last? Not 10 years, not 100 years, not 200 years, not 300 years, no, more. Look what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says. وَلَقَدْ أَرْسَلْنَا نُوحًا إِلَىٰ قَوْمِهِ فَلَبِثَ فِيهِمْ أَلْفَ سَنَةٍ إِلَّا خَمْسِينَ عَامًا And we sent Nuh, Noah, may peace be upon him, to his people. He dwelled within them, calling them towards goodness for a thousand years, less 50, which means 950 years. He spoke to them, he called them. He instructed them, he tried with them. He answered all their questions. Now they started getting frustrated. A few hundred years down the line, they started frustrating Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam. Up to now, it was a discussion. It was a debate. Now they wanted to begin to threaten. They say, Oh Nuh, keep quiet. If you're not going to keep quiet, we're going to stone you to death. Look at these threats. Look at these threats. If you don't keep quiet, we're going to stone you. Allahu Akbar. What did Nuh alayhi salatu wasalam do? He knew Allah was with him. Not a day did he raise his hands to say, Ya Allah, destroy them. He kept on saying, Ya Allah, guide my people. Ya Allah, guide my people. Ya Allah, guide these people. He kept on saying it. He was patient. He was patient for a long, long time. And Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala 
makes mention of how patient he was with his people, even though they, they started calling him names. They said, this man is mad, he's mental. Junoon. And they said, this man is possessed, he has a jinn in him. Leave him for some time, he'll come normal. He's got a problem, he's got a jinn. Imagine they are speaking from the very beginning. In huwa illa rajulun bihi jinnah. This is a man who has a jinnah. He has a jinnah in him. That's why he's telling you to do things. He's stupid because can't he see we have the money? Let him do a business deal or two with us and we'll be able to make him rich and wealthy and he'll be able to enjoy life just as we are. But he's stupid. He'll understand. Leave him on one side and don't associate with him and you see what will happen. Up to today. Our business partners can destroy our deen if they are not on deen. Remember this carefully. If we have a man and we are making so much money through him, don't allow him to control your religion. Never. Don't allow him to change your mind regarding Allah. Don't drop your guard when it comes to him. You can drop him when it comes to Allah. And this is what we have seen. Those who fear Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, when they are engaged in business deals and making money through somebody, if they drop that person, when that person begins to come between them and Allah, they have achieved happiness and contentment and they die in a condition of Iman. Whereas when it comes to a person who has compromised the deen of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and they have engaged in injustice, what happens today? A man is rich, we know him, so we side with him. Sometimes you get a scholar of Islam, may Allah protect us all. Shaitan comes to the scholars sometimes as well. And you find there is a dispute. One side there's a rich man, the other side there's a poor man. Come the scholar, he says, no man. Either, look, I can't involve here, number one. That's the sweetest way out. Or he will say, you know what? I think he is right. Pointing at who? Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala keep us upon justice. Not only scholars, in our families. Sometimes we perpetrate grave injustice solely because of wealth. Allahu Akbar. Now we are standing on a pedestal. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. And may he grant us a deep understanding. With Nuh alayhi salatu was salam, he told his people, as the verse is in Surah Hud, وَلَا أَقُولُ لَكُمْ عِنْدِي خَزَائِنُ اللَّهِ وَلَا أَعْلَمُ الْغَيْبَ وَلَا أَقُولُ إِنِّي مَلَكِ وَلَا أَقُولُ لِلَّذِينَ تَزْدَرِي أَعْيُنُكُمْ لَنْ يُؤْتِيَهُمُ اللَّهُ خَيْرًا اللَّهُ أَعْلَمُ بِمَا فِي أَنفُسِهِمْ إِنِّي إِذَا لَمِنَ الظَّالِمِينَ Oh my people, I am not telling you that I am an angel. And I am not telling you that I own the treasures of the earth. And I'm not saying that by following me, you'll become loaded. A lot of people think, hey, you know what? I'm a good Muslim. Why am I not making money? Well, Allah didn't promise you that if you're a good Muslim, you'll become as rich as Bill Gates. No, he didn't promise that. But when you're a good Muslim, you achieve contentment of the heart. A good Muslim who has 50 rands in his pocket is far better than a sinner who has 5 million in his pocket. And believe me, he will sleep in a far more blissful sleep, if I can use that word. And he will probably snore. Whereas the other one is busy putting in all the pills and still he can't sleep. And they know, this is why all sleeping pills are very expensive. Allahu Akbar. They know that those who need them have money. Allahu Akbar. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala safeguard us from all forms of sickness. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala grant sleep to those who are suffering with insomnia. And may Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open all our doors of goodness and grant us good health. May He grant cure to those who are ill and sick. And may He have mercy to those who are suffering on the globe today. So He says, Oh my people, I'm not promising you you're going to get big wealth. And I don't know the unseen. So don't come and ask me what's behind the wall. And don't come and ask me what are these people going to have tomorrow. I'm not claiming to know the unseen. And... Oh my people, not only do I not claim to know the unseen, but don't think that I am going to chase away those whom your eyes look down upon. Going back to the same point. Look at how many times it's repeated in the Quran. Where Allah speaks about how the downtrodden, 
the messengers were instructed to kick them out. Allah says, I'm not going to do that. Then Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala speaks about how they called him mad. Surah Al-Qamar, it rhymes very, very well. The surah is powerful. Allah says, كَذَّبَتْ قَبْلَهُمْ قَوْمُ نُوحٍ فَكَذَّبُوا عَبْدَنَا وَقَالُوا مَجْنُونٌ وَازْدُجِرٌ they have belied the Prophet Nuh before and they have rejected the message of one of our worshippers. Allah calls him Kadhabu Abdana. Allah says Abdana meaning my worshipper. My worshipper. They have belied. Waqalu Majnoonun and they called him mad. Was Dujir and they rebuked him. They swore him. They mocked at him. They tortured him. They engaged in all forms of evil, but he was still saying, Oh Allah, guide my people. Then there came a time when Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, It was the final straw. These people came to Nuh alayhi salam and they said, Ya Nuh, this is in Surah Hud. Qalu ya Nuh, qad jadaltana. فَأَكْثَرْتَ جِدَالَنَا فَأْتِنَا بِمَا تَعِدُنَا إِن كُنْتَ مِنَ الصَّادِقِينَ They said, O oh Nuh, you have debated with us, you have argued with us, and you have prolonged that debate, promising us that some punishment is going to come to us, some punishment is going to come to us. You kept saying that, bring that punishment, we want it now. If you are truthful, come, let's see it. Imagine, they are asking for the punishment. Allahu Akbar, may Allah protect us. Whenever we are reminded in the masjid, usually the miracle of Allah, and believe me, I've seen this almost all the time. The miracle of Allah, whenever there is an alim speaking in the front, and we are being reminded, it will apply to many of us as though he is speaking about us and he knows us. Allahu Akbar. But he doesn't know you and it is Allah communicating directly to your heart. Many people have come to me and they've told me, look, today you spoke about this. Did someone tell you I had this problem? <laughs> Wallahi, not at all. Allah knows you had the problem so he made something feel within you. Let me go and sit there. So when you sat there, ma asabaka lam yakul What got to you was never ever meant to miss you. Subhanallah. If it got to your ears, Allah made you make an effort to come and listen to it. And then Allah is going to ask you, didn't we send a warner to you? Do you remember that day you felt he was talking to you? Well, I was talking to you. Subhan al-Khaliq. Amazing. That is Allah. So they told Nuh alayhi salam, you know what? You have done so much and you've argued and you've debated. Now we want to see what this punishment is. So Nuh alayhi salam, although he was so patient for many, many years, many, many years, 950 years, do you know what happened? Finally, he raised his hands. Imagine. Now when a saint raises his hands, remember, those who are friends of Allah have a lot of patience, a lot of patience. When you harm them, when you trouble them, when you spread rumor about them, when you, uh, you know, create problems for them, when you make their life difficult, when you block them, when you stop them, they will be patient. They will continue making dua for your goodness, your guidance. But patience has a limit. Remember that. Every Nabi has stopped at a point. No Nabi has just carried on and on until he was destroyed. No. Every Nabi has had a limit when he called out to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So Nuh alayhi salam raised his hands and he made a dua. And I just want to share with you one verse. Tomorrow we will continue with what the dua was and what happened as a result. But today, there is a verse that brings tears to the eyes. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, speaking about Nuh alayhi salam, that he went through so much, he went through so much turbulence, so much sabr, that only a handful of people accepted his message in 950 years. Imagine, the narration makes mention of 11 people. In 950 years, 11. 11. And there is another narration, that makes mention of the maximum 80 people. So let us take the maximum. If we say 
80 people in 950 years, you can work it out. In a hundred years, how many? One or two. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. So after that patience, enduring, he raises his hands. Allah says, وَلَقَدْ نَادَانَا نُوحٌ فَلَنِعْمَ الْمُجِيبُونَ Nuh alayhi salam called out to us. We responded immediately to our worshiper. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. We are the best of those who respond, Allah says. So if any one of us has endured a lot, remember the day you raise your hands, it will come immediately. It will come straight. This is why the Prophet sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, اتَّقِ دَعْوَةَ الْمَظْلُومِ فَإِنَّهُ لَيْسَ بَيْنَهَا وَبَيْنَ اللَّهِ حِجَابٍ Be careful of a dua made against you by the one whom you have oppressed. Because there is no barrier between that dua and Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So if you have wronged someone, you are doomed if they have to raise their hands. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala open our doors. Tomorrow we will listen to the dua that was responded immediately by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala until we meet insha'Allah. Wa sallallahu wa sallam wa baraka ala nabina Muhammad. Subhanallahi bihamdih. Subhanakallahumma bihamdika nashhadu an la ilaha illa anta nastaghfiruka wa natubu ilayki.